This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So uh, seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 5.31 p.m. on Tuesday, July 28th. Um, and we will uh, take a roll call um, attendance. Um, Mr. Demling, please uh, state present when I call your name. Demling present. Uh, Ms. Lord. Lord present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ben McDonald present. Ms. Hall. All right, thank you. Seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee. We'll also start with roll call attendance. Mr. Menino. Menino present. Ms. Barlow. Barlow present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. And Hall present. Thank you, Chair McDonald. And now, uh, seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order the Regional School Committee at 5.32 p.m. Um, please state present when I call your name. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Mr. Menino. Menino present. Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. McDonald present. Mr. Sullivan? Not present. Um, so moving on. I don't believe that we have minutes um, this evening. Uh, Dr. Morris? Um, yep. Yeah, so um, and let me start recording actually as well. I forgot to do that. So I just got a text from um, CLO. She had some travel, unexpected travel delays today. So she will take notes, minutes from the meeting on the recording. Um, and she said by tomorrow she'll have the minutes, but she regretted that because she knew that it would be more helpful to have them tonight. But she offered her apologies and she is working literally on the plane, working on them right now. So <laughs> yeah. I'm sure she wasn't aware that she, uh, that we'd be meeting every week um, and multiple times in a week for to sign up for this job. So, um, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so we'll move on to public comment and school committee announcements. Um, we do have uh, one recording, voice message, and um, as well as some written comment. And before I play these, I, um, several folks have been asking us to read aloud um, the if. Uh, we will display the written um, public comment on screen. Um, if folks would like to have their their comments heard um, or, or read aloud, um, we have the opportunity, we offer the opportunity for folks to um, submit a voice recording. Um, either they can record their, their voice and email that to me, or they can call the phone line, the public comment phone line and leave a message there. Um, so that's the best opportunity for your um, your comments to be heard. Um, and we accept them up until 3 p.m. on the day of our meetings. So uh, with that, I will play our first comment. Hi, this is Ryan Wells. I am a resident of Amherst. Our kids in Amherst um, Wildwood Elementary School as well as the Amherst High School. I'm calling to add to the conversation about plans for schools reopening. Uh, and I would like to add to the conversation an important opinion piece that was in the New York Times uh, on July 20th by Sharda Jogi. Uh, it presents a really innovative plan that I think meets a lot of the goals that people are trying to achieve. It essentially has all teaching and learning online. So teachers' labor is dedicated to that. However, schools would be open for any student that wanted to come and have um, support staff, access to technology, including meals, nursing care, so the safe place for the vulnerable uh, students, but as well as anyone who wanted to could come to school. It would keep the density low. Um, it would, the paraprofessionals, um, as well as other support staff, could pr 
probably staff that, as well as maybe some teachers, depending on how that was, was um, laid out. Uh, but I think if you read that piece, it states it more eloquently than I can about how this meets many good goals. So I would like to encourage you to consider fully online teaching and learning, but schools to be a place where students could still come on the bus, could have support staff, could have technology, could get their meals um, for anyone who wanted, but not to have quote unquote in-person learning. They would be supported in online learning there with laptops and computers and whatnot. So again, this is in the New York Times on July 20th. The title of it is How to Reopen the Economy Without Killing Teachers and Parents. I think it's an important piece that should be added to the conversation, and I would support uh, some kind of a plan that was similar to that. Thank you. And now I will um, share this document. Are folks able to see this? Okay. And I will um, note that this will be posted on our um, uh, regional school committee agendas page on the arps.org website for, the, for folks that um, would like to read it on their own time or on their own screen.
um, all set. Um, great. Um, and uh, somebody uh, just pointed out uh, to me <laughs> this evening that um, uh, that a lot of email in her inbox has been going into spam. Um, and she discovered a lot of um, email in there. And so I, I will say that um, just this afternoon, I discovered that the same was happening um, in my inbox. Um, and so there are, so for those of you that are wondering why haven't we shown your public comment, I noticed that there was a handful of public comment emails that did go into spam. Um, so we will, uh, we were, unfortunately I did not catch that in time to get it in for this evening, but we will be meeting again next week and we will include all of the past comment, including ones from past weeks into that public comment period next week. So I apologize again. Um, and just as a reminder, um, uh, email to McDonald A at arps.org with the subject line public comment. Please include your full name and your town of residence or the school in which you work. Um, and uh, voice message is always accepted as well. Uh, okay, so, uh, are there any school committee announcements? Announcements from members of the school committees? Mr. Demling, and then Ms. Lord. So um, this is a half-formed and somewhat emotional thought, so I uh, just ask that you bear with me a little bit. Um, I just wanted to try to say something briefly about the need for all of us here on the committees and, and also the public at large as well to speak out against um, any personal attacks during the, the ongoing discussion about fall reopening. Um, I've seen personal attacks on social media recently against uh, more than one of my school committee colleagues and uh, it's it's wrong and, and it, I, it, I feel it, it has to stop. And I just want to say publicly and very clearly and matter of factly that no matter how strongly I have ever disagreed with anyone here about any topic recently or in the past, I don't for a second doubt that every member here takes COVID extremely seriously, cares deeply for staff and student safety, cares, cares about the education of all students, is sincerely trying their best in a very difficult situation to serve the common good, and to, to our community's credit, 99% of the input that we've received um, uh, has had the same level of personal kindness and understanding, um, even though the, the disagreement that we've heard has at times been very strong. Um, but, but I see the personal vitriol starting, starting to creep in a little bit, you know, and you see it on social media first because it's, it's, it's that toxic echo chamber. Um, and, and we've seen in the past in our community that it, it can get out of hand. Um, uh, we've, we've seen that happen with div divisive topics in, in recent years. Um, and so I, I think the best way to inoculate ourselves to, for our community to achieve herd immunity for this kind of behavior, so to speak, is, is to call it out when we see it happen, especially when we see it happen to someone we disagree with, to someone and to stand up and defend that person and say, you know, I, I, do, I don't agree with the point, but you can't attack someone like that. You can't treat people like that. Find a different way to state the case. And I, I really feel like it's, it's like a bully situation. You know, uh, the best way to stop bullying behavior is for, is for the group to say, hey, don't bully that kid. You know, so I, I, I really feel that it's a public collective responsibility for us to model, but also, you know, for there to be public examples as well. Uh, to actively defend those that you most strongly disagree with from personal attacks. And I think if we can model that kind of civil discourse here and, and, and social media and elsewhere, uh, it'll lead to the best kind of uh, discussion and then we'll have the best kind of outcomes for students. Um, so that's just what I want to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Well stated. Uh, Ms. Lord? I would like to invite all of you to tomorrow night's School Equity Task Force meeting at 6.30 p.m. That is July 29th, Wednesday. School Equity Task Force. See you there. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and I want to also recognize that we have a few um, others um, in attendance this evening. We have our student uh, representative on the school committee, Emily Gribko, um, who has joined us this evening, as well as um, Dr. Morris and um, Ms. Cunningham. Are there any other uh, school committee announcements? Seeing none, um, we'll move on to the superintendent's update. Dr. Morris? Sure. So, uh, sorry, I was away last Thursday and wasn't at the meeting. Um, and I guess two meetings of superintendent update weren't enough. So I've got a rather lengthy one tonight. So I, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, but uh, I think in the first point, you know, I just want to say, I didn't know Mr. Denling was going to say what he was going to say. And thankfully, um, I don't do much social media uh, for better or worse. Um, but I do want to say and offer a sincere appreciation for the committees. Uh, for how many times you're meeting and how deeply you're considering the topic. Wherever, you know, the group lands and whether it lands where I want it to land or doesn't, you know, none of that really matters to me at the moment. The most important thing is that the elected officials from the four communities have been actively engaged in this and are trying to work on the best solution possible in a very difficult circumstance. So, you know, I don't know how much you all hear that and hopefully you, you do uh, and maybe sometimes you don't. Uh, but, you know, I think um, I'll be frank, there are some communities where the school committee has said, oh, yeah, superintendent, go figure it out. You know, sort of, this seems messy. We, <laughs> we're not going to play in the mud. Uh, we'll, we'll watch you. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just, I think that's actually really mistaken policy, to be honest with you, because this is big enough issues where it really is at a policy level um, in a crisis. And so, I just want to appreciate how many meetings you've all taken on over the last three months and the depth of the conversation you've had. And even when it's hard and there's disagreements, uh, you know, th I just wanted to start by saying that I appreciate all of your work and, and on this and how often someone emails me or talks to me because they've read a new article from some other resource. And it's like, this is a new way. I got a good one today about like, you know, can you look at infection rate by hospital zone? Is that a different way to think about how to keep track of it. And I'll just say, personally, I really appreciate all those reach outs, uh, you know, and all the information that, that I receive from you all and your engagement in it. Um, so, you know, I start from a place of thanks and in a place of appreciation and, and how tiring uh, this must be for you on top of all the other responsibilities you have that aren't your, you know, this isn't your quote unquote day job. Uh, and I wanna acknowledge that as well. And it, it probably has felt like that over the last couple of weeks. Um, so that was my first point. The second point, um, I just wanted to clarify because I got a couple of questions over the last couple of days and we sent out a phasing survey today uh, to families and staff and middle school and high school students as well. Um, just trying to see, you know, what was their reaction to the three different phasing models. But one thing I wanted to say publicly is when we thought about, um, I got a lot of questions about, well, homeless students, life students, ELL students uh, who aren't in grade levels that are attending in person, what would that model be? And I wanted to briefly touch on that. And really it's modeling it off, you know, and you probably all have read or heard about this, uh, that folks are organizing in many parts of the country, actually did this spring, even locally, pods, right? So the idea is that you'd have a group of students together taking similar courses and, and participating often in online learning, but with additional support. And, you know, we're trying to think of students who, for a whole host of reasons, uh, there may be more barriers to them accessing uh, online learning or virtual learning or distance learning. And we wanna support them to access it with some live instruction and live tutoring support. And that's really the model that we're trying to think of. It's not that the students would be sort of have a different experience or a lesser experience than the other students in fifth grade, for instance, who wouldn't be starting in phase one or even phase two. It's actually, how do we supplement and support the distance learning they've received by having some live support throughout their time uh, during the school day. And, and they're often uh, students who will benefit in other ways from being in school as well. And so, you know, that's sort of the model. We weren't thinking that they wouldn't access the rich resources that students at their grade level would, act, would be able to access. We'd actually just want them to access it with enhanced uh, professional support from our staff. Um, so I apologize for not being clear about that the first time. I wanted to clarify that the second time. Um, I wanted to also clarify, sorry, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I, I, again, I apologize, I know the group's been meeting so much. Um, that I know there's been some public comments about why school committee um, isn't meeting live as we're talking about live instruction. And I did, uh, you know, a couple of school committee members did talk to me about that. 
Privately, I reached out to the town manager of Amherst, um, and he indicated that there has been no change. That the, um, you know, I think this was sort of spoken about in the past, but that um, public meetings aren't allowed to be public at the moment um, in the way that they typically would be. Um, that this is the access point. But I do also do want to share that we have started meeting live for our leadership team meetings because we don't have the same constraints that um, public bodies have, and it's been a really good experience. I think to uh, to be able to simulate, you know, to understand what it's like to be like today, we had one relatively warm room mask and, and what did that feel like? What did it feel like from a spacing perspective and how different did it feel to be communicating in person versus communicating virtually? And, you know, I, you know, I, I could go on and on and on about that. I won't, cause I don't want to politicize our experience uh, at a leadership team and try to extrapolate it. Uh, but I do want to at least acknowledge to the committee and the community um, that I think it, it's, you know, you're all constrained in ways that we're not, and we actively are starting to uh, have meetings in person so we can uh, can simulate some of those experiences and learn from them as we're moving forward. So um, I wanted to share that piece. Um, tents are in, which is good that were ordered. So thanks to our facilities department for that. Uh, you know, we have to get a permitted uh, and permit approved before they can go up, but that's all good news. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the survey on phasing options went out today. I did get a couple of responses uh, from families that I wanted to, enough where I wanted to share publicly that uh, we would we would be asking families their preference for distance learning or in person after the phasing model, um, you know, uh, whatever phasing model, you know, assuming one's voted next week, uh, that seems like it'd be the right time, particularly for students and families who are in the phase one group to ascertain their, uh, their thoughts about that. Uh, for many families, which phasing model we would have would, would uh, you know, just frankly, if we went to phasing model number three, some students wouldn't come back till January. So asking people in, in July uh, whether they would plan to send their children to school in January, you know, just feels like really disconnected. So we'd want to understand what the phasing model is that also might influence some people's choices about whether they're coming to the district or coming, um, you know, come to school live, um, for some students it might be too early, too late, right? We don't know all those variables, but I want families to know that we are intending to ask them. And as soon as we have clarity from, frankly, from you all about, you know, some thoughts and from the community, which will, I know, inform your thinking about uh, a phasing model to choose, uh, we'll be reaching out to families. But I think some families were expecting at the end of the survey to get a question of like, are you sending, planning to send your child back to school? And I want to just, I'll respond to those emails, but I thought I got you know, uh, enough of them where it was a good point and one worth uh, responding to publicly. Um, work is ahead of schedule at Fort River and at Wildwood in terms of the renovations, so that's really good news. Uh, I'm not concerned about the completion of those projects well before the school year starts, and, um, you know, thanks again for everyone who's working on those, both our staff and our contractors, who understand that every day we finish, that the work is finished earlier, that really helps our teachers. Um, so, you know, thanks to everyone working on those projects. My last few things are uh, all focused on uh, five different pieces of guidance we've gotten from DESE since we last spoke on Tuesday, since I last spoke with you all on Tuesday. Uh, so the latest one was last night, which I believe I forwarded to you. If I didn't, I apologize and will do so. But uh, DESE and the MTA, as well as the Boston Teachers Association and the AFT, which is another teacher association that has a smaller foot, uh, footprint in the state, uh, agreed that uh, instead of having 180 school days, there'd be 170 school days for students next year. It allows for a later start to the school year and more professional development to occur for staff before students return. I celebrate this, uh, this decision because I think uh, we want to be able to provide that. Um, I know not everyone's celebrating the decision from what I hear speaking of points made earlier on social media. Uh, it's probably good for both DESE and the unions, you know, uh, you know, getting some flack for it. I think that flack is wrong. Uh, I think this is what's needed. And so I'm really pleased with the result of, of 10 school days before the school year. Uh, the, the guidance indicated that uh, September 16th would be uh, what school would need to start by then. If we push back, roll back our schedule by 10 days, we end up more or less on or around September 16th, um, thereabouts. Next week, I'll be able to bring you a revised calendar for your consideration. We had a draft that was finished about 40 minutes ago, uh, which I have yet to look at. So um, I did not bring it 
here, but uh, pretty good for getting the, that email out last night. Ms. Westmoreland is magical, but um, we'll, we'll bring that to you. We'll also share it with our association, which we have yet to do. Um, but it, it does, the, the new calendar does have 10 professional development days. Typically we only have two. It has 10 professional development days before the school year. Uh, our version of it pushes some of the teacher return dates back a slight bit uh, as well to give everybody more time to be prepared. Uh, which we think is in the best interest of um, students and staff. So more soon on the schedule. The other four pieces of guidance, uh, I'll go over very briefly because I know I'm already uh, past my allotted time for superintendent update. Uh, one of them was about transportation guidance. So that's one that's been coming up a lot. Uh, it's worth noting that the use of masks and proper PPE is required uh, on buses and vans, even for our younger students. Again, for us at k one that's not a conflict because we've already you know, recommended that, but for other districts, that would be a change. Um, essentially, what it looks like is one student per bench alternating sides for each row. Uh, ventilation is that windows are kept early unless the weather, it would be dangerous to leave the window, to, to have the windows open. So the vast majority of days, they'd be open. Um, that students would be assigned to a seat. So it wouldn't be uh, open seating, it would be uh, assigned seating. And that's really for contract tracing if there was ever an issue. Uh, that we would have assurance. We wouldn't have to worry about what day it was and what, you know, just think about, you know, what day, what seat did you use last Tuesday, you know, to a first grader and, you know, just not reasonable. So we want to have clarity on that. That all makes sense. Bus monitors are recommended, not required. It could be current staff. It could also draw from parent guardian organ, or parent guardians who are willing to do that. Um, so we're looking into that as soon as this morning we were working on that. Um, cleaning and disinfecting buses after each morning and afternoon route. Uh, for capacity, uh, what we have, our buses are almost all 71 passenger buses. Uh, now, to be clear, we have no buses where they are filled to 71 students because that would be every single three students per row and every single row. None of our buses are that full. Um, but what the result of the um, DESE guidance is, is that 23 students could be on a bus. Uh, there is some allowance. Siblings might be able to sit right next to each other. Um, but you have to seed them in a certain seed. And, you know, so so we're going to low end it. And if we can get more on because of siblings, that'll be a bonus. Um, so that's more or less what we anticipate. I think we've talked about in a public meeting other states were coming up with with landing that. So I think down the road, uh, particularly for the elementary schools, not so much for secondary because of the hybrid model there, we will have to talk about um, do we want to change? Do we want to limit our enrollment some and look at hybrid models up our elementary grades? Or do we want to, um, you know, um, essentially um, reduce the number of students who qualify for a bus? I think it's premature to do that until we know which students are coming back. I think it was a mistake to go down that road. One of the nice things about the phasing is we don't actually have to make that decision uh, or make that calculation super soon. We've actually got a little bit of time to work on that. Um, but I do want to say that that is a reality of 23 students in a bus and on vans, it is even more limiting. And, and so we are, our transportation department is uh, actively working with this new information. Um, so I see there's a question. I was going to transition off, transition off transportation, but I see there's a question. Mr. Menino. What if a bus has 23 available slots and there are 24 students at the bus stop? What happens to that excess student? So there are no excess students because students would be assigned to a specific seat and then only students who are assigned to a specific seat are allowed on a bus. Thank you. Yep. And no other questions I'll go on. Um, facility, yeah. again, I'm just doing a very brief. Sorry, Dr. Sorry. Seeger? Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. No, sorry, I, I just raised my hand. Um, so this is, I, I didn't know when to ask questions, but um, my question is about the survey in general that you just put out. Um, uh, as a parent of an incoming seventh grader from Leverett, um, I'm just concerned that those parents aren't on an email list yet. So I'm wondering um, how they get notified. And I don't know yep. if this is the same for Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. No, so I will. And I know that I understand there's been a leadership change in that school. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I will make sure it goes out tomorrow. I'll talk to Ms. Hegger. I'll actually see virtually see um, uh, Ms. Colkeen tomorrow. So um, I will confirm that that will get out. Um, but thank you for the reminder. It's always helpful. Um, and I'll make sure that happens. 
Thank you. Um, so moving on to facilities and operations, there's actually not much new in that document. It's things we've been talking about for months. Uh, and thanks to our facilities team, lots of those things are in place. I think one of the big things, uh, you know, I think the two things maybe worth sharing are one, to really think about staff offices uh, in two ways. One is where, do, where are their office staff who are closer than six feet apart? Uh, but that one we'd already mapped out. The other one, which was sort of an interesting one we hadn't mapped out as much, is there are some schools where the, the door to the office positions the visitor, and we're not having visitors, but I mean by visitor, anyone who walks through the door, to by default be closer than six feet. You know, you open the door and the person is right in front of you. And so that is something that we should have thought about. And that's the good thing about state guidance is it, it catches you on the things that you miss. We were thinking so much about keeping staff members six feet away from each other. We weren't as much thinking about where doors would be, not having visitors, but they're right. Well, staff members and students walking in there. So uh, we're doing some, some reanalysis or new analysis of that. So that was very helpful to have in that document. Uh, another piece is that uh, mass break spaces, and we've made a determination that those should be outside. Uh, that you know, when we're talking about mass breaks, uh, that that's synonymous with being outside. Um, so, and use the the uh, metaphor of smokers' corners or something like that. Uh, you know, which you know some people may resonate with, maybe not. Uh, but the idea is that you know that's really should be mostly done outside. Obviously, if students need a mass break, need to adjust it, or staff, they're going to do it. But for a real break, like extended time with mass off, that should be done outside. Uh, and I want to thank some of the PGOs are already doing great fundraising and collecting of rain jackets and things where all students will have more capacity uh, to be outside, regardless of the weather next year. Um, they're just phenomenal. And maybe the last thing I'll mention, because it's something that you all talked about, is um, you know, they talked about where to eat lunch. And if you're not doing six foot distancing, it means half your class, for instance, might have to go out for recess. So the other half can eat lunch and vice versa. You know, that three foot thing keeps on coming up with more and more issues. So just more indication of an appreciation that you were, I think the first ones on the six foot uh, bandwagon in the Commonwealth. And every single time new guidance comes out, it just reinforces that that, that was the right train to be on. So uh, I was glad to disregard that guidance um, because it doesn't apply to us. Um, the next piece of guidance was for courses requiring additional safety. Oh, sorry. Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, I just have a quick question on uh, sort of staying on that uh, lunch topic because uh, students would have to remove their masks for lunch. Would that be outdoors then given your mask break guidance, the mask breaks will be outdoors. Would therefore lunch be outdoors? You know, it, I think ideally, yes. And, you know, you can't always eat out in the rain. Right. So I think there are, you know, when you think about insects and all that, um, so I think that may be the one exception of where we do have mass breaks inside because students do have to eat. Um, and I think about some students, you know, eating outside, just depending on the age of the student, maybe um, maybe something we regret in the end um, in terms of stains and clothes. I'm just thinking of like the youngest kids and preschoolers and, you know, but I think um, the guidance that we received is the six feet piece for lunch, you know, uh, needs to happen. That's why the three feet piece would be out. Uh, but we're not planning every lunch period outside. But I think when the con when the conditions provide, that's going to be the ideal preferred location. You know, um, you know, is that going to happen in January, for instance? It's hard to totally imagine that happening in January. Hopefully, it can happen in September, October, pretty routinely. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Ms. Spitzer. I also just want to bring up that, I mean, right now, I think our children are also getting, or I should say now, but prior to COVID, we were, we were delivering um, breakfast. We were also often, you know, at least as a parent, I was often getting a request to send in a nutritious snack. So I think those times are also going to be times when we're going to worry about distancing and maybe have a preference for being outdoors. Yep, are, I would are agree. We list anymore? I mean, or maybe that's for a different time, but it's just, it's, since we're having a later start day, at some point, it, it might be good to get an update on how that would, in fact, uh, affect kids who rely on um, breakfast. Yeah, there's a whole food service component that we should probably talk about because it's actually broader than that. There's some indication that the federal government won't extend waivers that we had this spring for. Well, there's not there's not indication. They said they won't extend waivers uh, for us to be reimbursed for meals that are delivered outside the school. That is a lot of pushback on that for obvious reasons, but that would have uh, huge implications around, well, both food scarcity and financial implications. 
Um, so I think maybe a week or two from now, we can think about having Mr. Uh, Gallo O'Connell come in and, and talk about his planning for the year. Because um, I think also even in the phased model, and he's been in all those conversations, uh, you know, just think about, it, you know, getting to sites plus being on, you know, being on the campuses and what that'll look like. So I think, you know, I just wonder if we can have uh, Michael come in and, and talk about a lot of these things in his current thinking. But that's okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to breathe, try to breeze through. I keep trying, uh, being unsuccessful. Uh, my problem. Uh, I apologize. Uh, so the third one was we got guidance for courses requiring additional safety requirements. That's chorus, singing, brass and woodwind instrument use, physical education, dance and theater. Um, so the requirements, I'll just breeze through them. Uh, chorus, singing, musical theater and band only permitted outside, uh, outdoors with masks and 10 feet of social distancing. And that's again, because of the increased respiration that comes along with those. Non-musical theater, whether inside or outside, although outside is recommended, mass and six feet of social distancing because uh, the lack of singing. Phys PE and dance, uh, if outdoors without mass, activities would allow 10 feet of social distancing. We're really wondering about the viability of outdoors without mass and then 10 feet. I mean, just having students 10 feet apart. Uh, we, I mapped it out today when we were in our meet after our meeting and the difference between 16 and six feet and 10 feet, I'm not trying to be silly about this, is when you're trying to get a group of people at a space, indoors or outdoors, is really significant. 10 feet is really far. It's re and, and have a group of students all 10 feet apart from each other um, is, is, you know, ex not, exponential, ex not exponentially different than six, but it feels that way when you try to do it. Um, and if indoors for PE and dance, dance masks are required and activities must allow for six feet of so physical distancing. And the short story is we're looking for PE uh, to be uh, outside as often as as is uh, conceivable, and what was conceivable pre-COVID is is were, is expanded in terms of what would keep kids inside uh, for physical education. Um, courses that involve regular regular sharing of equipment like visual arts uh, require frequent hand washing um, and six feet of distancing, three feet of wearing masks, which I don't understand because it's six feet and wearing masks. Uh, but basically the short story is to um, to reduce the amount of shared equipment and wash hands more frequently. So that was the third piece of guidance. All right, cleanup role number four, uh, last one I got for you is the guidance for remote learning. Uh, the short story is the time on learning would be the same as what the expectations would be for in-school learning, you know, with the reduction in hours. Uh, with the 10 fewer days, but having full days of instruction. Another change is a real move. If you remember last year, it could be like a resource delivery model where activities were provided for families. And this year it has to be much more focused on instruction uh, and not providing resources for students and families. Um, there need, there require, there's required regular consistent opportunities to have live synchronous instruction. Uh, students are to receive grades. Uh, with the exceptions for students under extreme circumstances, but everybody that's those are supposed to be fewer and far between. Uh, but grades are supposed to be given, attendance is taken, just like normally do on power school, um, to figure out our mechanism for which classes students are taking. But the idea is that students are, are required to show up for their classes. Um, schools have to have a plan for, again, our, our um, mild to moderate special education students, our ELL students, um, and that we have to assure that um, access and connectivity to the best of our ability. As I mentioned before, we've, bunch of, we've purchased a number of Chromebooks. We actually just tried to purchase a number for um, Pelham and for the region, just for a little, little coverage for the region in case some of our graduated seniors, we're trying to get them back and we're mostly the way there, we're not all the way there. And for Pelham as well, a little bit of a supplier challenge in terms of Chromebooks right now, given things going on, other part of the world that it, we're not worth getting into. Um, but that's sort of what the distance learning is in short, that it's it's intended to be not necessarily be students online all day, because it might be, you know, students get an asynchronous lesson, have a synchronous work group, you know, that might be a small group with the teacher, have some independent work to do as a follow-up, but that all their courses are taught and all the standards are met, uh, which is a really different thing than what the state was requesting last spring, which was half a day's of work, and our survey showed that students did half a day's of work at work. Um, so we were spot on for what that was, uh, but this is a different model. We are exploring uh, both internal in-house uh, experts in distance learning by creating some time for a couple staff to uh, do some PD this month or next month, excuse me, I thought we were in August already, uh, next month and to have um, some partial release from their teaching responsibilities 
in the fall semester so that we have some um, ongoing support as well as some external support. We've talked to a couple of uh, schools that have existed for a long time virtually. They're providing a lot of ongoing support. It's not people who are doing this on the fly. They had existing professional development models long before the COVID time. Uh, but we want to support our staff uh, incredibly because as you all know, in all the phasing models, the majority of students in the districts would not start in person in school. Uh, there was no model that was presented that has more than 50% or more than 30% uh, of students starting in school. So we really want to support teachers about in-school instruction. When we have those 10 days, we'll do that about safety, uh, care, uh, how to teach a little different, how to teach not a little different, how to teach differently, given the different arrangement of desks, uh, the ability to do group work has to look different. So we want to support that, but we also want to support distance learning because we always never know whether something's going to happen and on a dime, we're going to be on distance learning the next day. Um, and so we want to invest in both in both training staff for the in-person as well as for the distance because we have to be flexible and nimble between those. And that is my update. Great. I see two questions, Mr. Menino and then Ms. Spitzer. With respect to distance learning, I read the guidance for Boston that teachers will simultaneously teach in-person and distance learning and they can figure out how to do it. Uh, my question is, uh, could, can we be updated someday on how a teacher will simultaneously teach in person, uh, asynchronous, and when they run out to that tent, how do they get asynchronous distance learning when they're in the tent? Sometime it'd be useful to discuss those issues. I'm going to briefly answer, Mr. Mignot, if that's okay with the chairs. Um seeing head nods. So uh, happy to talk about it in more detail. I want to suggest, and, and I'm not trying to criticize other districts, Boston's not the only one. Um, I actually don't believe it's um, instructionally viable to be teaching live in person and virtual simultaneously because you would use significantly different instructional techniques to be able to do so. Uh, the meeting I facilitated today, again, some of our leadership team, some people were live, uh, in person and some people were uh, away, you know, they weren't uh, able to be in Amherst, they were out of town or people were moving, whatever they were doing. And uh, it's not an instructional model you would choose um, because you're really, the thing we learned last spring and this came out in the surveys and the thing the research would tell you is you would teach, re use really different instructional methodology if you're teaching in a virtual environment. And I think you've done that, Mr. Menino, as, as opposed to teaching in person. And so to try to marry those two, I think is an exercise, uh, I don't want to overstate it. Well, I'm going to say my opinion. I think it's an exercise in futility. I think you, no one will be well served by that, least of all the teacher and the students, uh, because you would, you would functionally do different things. It'd be asking someone to play baseball while they're playing basketball. Could you technically catch a ball, shoot a ball at the same time? Yeah, you could. Would you do either of them well? No, you wouldn't. So, you know, I think when we think about the larger picture about who is doing, you know, teaching, it's that teachers who are in school would be teaching students in school. Uh, teachers who are teaching, and teachers could, could be in their spaces teaching virtually, but that you wouldn't be doing both at the same time. I don't think it's viable. Ms. Spitzer. So, um, glad to hear that. I completely agree with everything you said, just said Dr. Morris. Um, I think it, uh, sorry. So the one thing that popped up in my head when we, we were reading is just that we need to also provide some support to the parents who are going to be working with the younger kids and how to access this. I, I, I have a, several <laughs> advanced degrees and I still have trouble sometimes figuring out Google Classroom. Um, so I, I just think that it's, it's um, I don't know when's the right time to do this, but I think I'd really love to have um, add this, maybe it's not agenda planning now, but in a future agenda planning item, the distance learning and then look at it from the perspective of the student, the teacher, and the parents who are going to, or maybe it's a different caregiver, maybe it's a, you know, a babysitter or a grandparent, I don't know who, who that person is, but whoever is helping, especially the younger kids, access the distance learning, because most, you know, I have a, a second grader, uh, he's starting to get to be able to access it on his own, but I think anything younger than that, you, you really can't access it on your own. Yeah, no, I think that's spot on. And I would agree this came up at our leadership team meeting. I should have mentioned it. Um, and we think about some of those 10 days would be some ongoing support and training for families as well and caregivers as well. And, and we'd want to record those so that on a day where you're not available and an unusual caregiver 
you know, I don't mean unusual, but an, a caregiver that hasn't been went through a training um, would have access to that. We'd want to do things in multiple languages. And I don't think it's just an elementary issue. Frankly, it's, you know, how do middle school and high school families get access to Google Classroom so they can keep track of the assignments that their children are doing, um, not just look at the results on power school, right? You know, it's like you look at the results and you've, you sort of miss the boat if you're more involved in your child's education than you typically would be. Um, so, no, we, we actively are planning for the family piece or caregiver piece as well uh, for all the reasons you stated. Um, we are looking at some other products uh, instead of Google Classroom for the early childhood educators. There's um, some recommended to us by some of our early childhood educators that um, are on a list that uh, Mr. Champagne is looking into um, that have a little bit easier interface for the younger set as well. That's an aside, but I think it's worth mentioning given your comment. Ms. Stancer? Um, I don't have a question. I, I would like to say that this morning on public radio, I heard a superintendent from another Western Mass school district say they were just beginning to look at spaces, how they were going to configure spaces. And I wanted to say I really appreciate the initiative that you've taken, Dr. Morris, and that everybody else has, because it was something about waiting for a tool from DESE in order to figure out spacing. And I just thought, how far behind they, they are going to be compared to what you've been able to do in the district. So I just wanted to thank everybody involved in that. Thank you very much. I'll pass that along to our team. Great. Um, and um, I, I wanted to just add, uh, it's, a, it's related but not, um, the question about um, the uh, town halls that, um, or the town hall that will be scheduled with um, physicians. Do we have a date for that? Because I believe that might be before our next meeting. Do we have a date? I believe it's either next Monday or next Wednesday. I think that's where the email chain my last email on that chain was, please let us know whether next Monday or Wednesday looks better. And I don't think I could check, but I don't believe there's been a reply to that. Okay. Um, so for uh, folks that are, are less aware, and Ms. Spitzer, I don't know if you want to jump in because you've sort of been instrumental in, um, in pulling this together, but it, uh, it's a, a town hall Q&A with um, physicians um, from, the, from the region um, about uh, COVID-19. Is that an appropriate? <laughs> No, I mean, we, we um, so, you know, I, I work at, um, in healthcare, and so somebody I work with came forward and said he's a member of a team of physicians and doctors in the area who want to find a way to help help us plan. And so one of the things, um, I think it was Dr. Morris said, well, maybe it would be use useful for us to have um, kind of a Q&A with, with some experts on, from that, because none of us on this committee are um, health professionals. You know, I, I, I work in the healthcare system, but, and actually, I don't know, maybe there's somebody on Pelham, I shouldn't speak, um, but <laughs> nobody on the two committees that I'm on um, has, has a background as uh, healthcare delivery, you know, and, and so it seemed to make sense to, have an opportunity for us to get some feedback on our planning and also for for parents and for um, other concerned people in the teachers staff people in the community to have a chance to talk about it with with that public health experts thank you are there any other comments or, or questions for uh dr morris on this on his update nothing okay so we'll move on to um, new and continuing business. And we have one item for tonight. Um, we are discussing this staff section of the fall 2020 priorities planning. Uh, uh, Mr. Demling. Yes, uh, I'd like to state for the record that my wife is an employee of the Amherst School District. However, I feel that I can perform my official duties objectively and fairly on this item. And so I have filed the necessary 23B disclosure of appearance of conflict of interest form with the Amherst Town Clerk as required by Mass General Law, Chapter 268A, Paragraph 23B, Section 3, and I will be participating in this item. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I'm uh, going to continue under advisement from the State Ethics Commission to recuse myself from the conversation. So I'll 
cut my microphone and camera at this point. Thank you. And this dancer. Following along with Mr. Damling, um, I, I have also filed the same uh, information with this with the town and I am going to stay in this conversation tonight as well. Thank you. Um, so for um, I, uh, email, uh, uh, just to update everybody and bring sort of everybody up to speed and sort of where what, where we're at and what this item is this evening, um, just as a reminder, a week ago, um, the three committees uh, reviewed, discussed, and voted on two pieces of, of the planning framework. One was the, the main body of the framework um, that covered staff and student safety, um, in-person learning, and distance learning, and the other document was what we called the staff section. Um, the, all three committees voted and approved the main body of the document on Monday last week. Two of our three committees voted um, and approved the, the staff section on Monday. And the third committee, Amherst School Committee, voted that same document again on Thursday after failing on Monday, um, came back and voted that document and approved it on Thursday evening. We also um, voted um, to bring an addendum forward to the three committees for discussion and potential vote this evening. Um, so that is uh, the purpose of our discussion tonight, is to look at that proposed addendum to the already approved uh, staff section document. Um, and um, that uh, proposed language was emailed to everybody. Um, thank you, Ms. Spitzer. Um, so I don't know, um, would folks, I think it might be helpful because those that might be watching from home have not seen that um, proposed language. So. Um, not sure if you could share that easily, Ms. Spitzer. You can try to pull it up as well, because Ms. Spitzer has to participate in the conversation, or doesn't have to, but oh, right. choose to participate in the conversation. So let me see, because I think I was on that email, Ms. Spitzer, that you sent. So um, within 30 seconds, I should be able to pull that up. OK. Ms. Spitzer, would you like to? Sure. So um, I just want to thank everybody for um, we have a lot of meetings. Thank you very much for um, entertaining um, a potential change to the staff document. I, I would like to kind of say that this is language that I wrote in an effort to try to recognize that there are those of us who, us, but staff members, teachers who, who work in our schools, who also live with people who have, who may have um, conditions that make them more vulnerable to COVID. And I, I'm particularly, I think I said this clearly, I'm particularly concerned about anybody who has to choose between providing care to somebody in their household or providing care to our children. So um, the language that Dr. Morris is gonna pull up is something that I'm you know, i not a lawyer, I'm not a human resource professional, so I did my best and we have since received some guidance from our lawyer. Um, he's actually, and, and I received it about a half an hour before I had to be on the call, so I, I haven't had a chance to to craft language that would respond to the feedback we've heard from our attorney. Um, so I, I'm very open to that. Um, I just, you know, my I, I think I've communicated this very clearly. You know, I I'm particularly just concerned about those who might have to make a choice um, caring for those they live with and caring for our kids in the schools. So thank you very much for consideration. Does anybody want to um, start? And, and um, as, as Ms. Spitzer alluded to, I did share the um, the feedback that we received from the attorney, from our attorney on on this language. Um, so um, not sure if folks had a chance to read that, but um, the I think the 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 crux of of his feedback was on the will provide reasonable accommodations versus seek to accommodate to seek to provide accommodations for um, was, I, I think, if that's also your understanding, Ms. Spitzer. I, I think he did have a, a concern with the reasonable accommodations language because it borrows from the um, 
I'm going to make it wrong, but I believe it comes from ADA. And again, I, I, don't, I did not have enough time to process the feedback. Um, yeah, it was um, the uh, state and federal disability law is, is that language um, of reasonable accommodation is that. So um, his suggestion um, was to um, rephrase that so that there were not sort of, we avoid um, potential confusion um, or um, misunderstanding that this is not, um, we're not hewing to the, we're not, this is not part of that disability law, I think is that how I would sort of uh, claim that. Ms. Seeger. Is a suggestion that we replace the second bullet under support for staff with this wording or similar wording to this? No. no. Add this yeah. on. Okay. This would be an add to the already the existing document. Mr. Demling. So, so I I think I've said this before at the at the Amherst meeting, but so so this is my first time discussing this item with the three meetings. So I just sort of state it generally here. You know, my 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 general concern with with adding more than what's already in the staffing document is is getting ourselves into a position where we can't staff the model that we've identified right where we've we've, we've identified the educational model that, that we that we need and so and so we have we have certain positions on site that we're going to need to we're going to need to staff and so uh if we get ourselves into a position where um uh well, well one we if if a staff member um has an underlying medical condition. We're already saying we're providing reasonable accommodations, so that's that's already there. The first bullet, and then we'll and then we're also saying uh, we'll seek to accommodate for any reason, including household members, um, anyone who expresses their preference for remote work, including if you have a household member with with COVID. So if if we have those remote positions available, we'll see if that's possible. the The crux of this problem. Right is okay. What what if we run out of those remote positions? What what happens to that employee and their employment situation if 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 they're not if they have a situation where they have a household member, they're not comfortable working on site. We don't have the remote position available. What 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 will happen? Um, and then what 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 does the directive of seek to accommodate mean and require versus um, will provide reasonable accommodations and my you know my hesitancy has always been this this requirement language of will will repro will require will provide reasonable accommodations you know it 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 feels as if it puts us in this 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 requirement of of making an accommodation uh, potentially putting us in a situation we where we are um staffing a position that doesn't need to be staffed and i i wish we could do that um but um i i i, I don't I, I don't see how we can make that guarantee with with without you know alter altering the 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 educational model that we've we've identified so i guess so one of the questions i had uh from the previous discussion was was for um miss cunningham if, if if she's available and can kind of answer this question is so with with the guidance that all three committees have have already passed, um, which goes above and beyond employment law, which which says the district will seek to accommodate staff who, for any reason, including concerns, express a preference for full remote or mostly remote work to the extent that such positions are needed and available, and based on the instructional model. So like, what would happen with the current guidance in a situation where a staff member had a household member they had legitimate medical concerns about that household member um and this guidance was instructing you to seek to accommodate that situation like what how would that evaluation process play play out um can, can you kind of walk us through how that 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 this, this kind of guidance a, a, a applies there are a couple of thoughts here um mr demling <clears throat> because you hit the nail on the head when you started asking, how do we prioritize who we are going to provide the, or seek to provide the reasonable accommodation for? So if we have many staff members who have a, a household with someone who they have this concern about, how will we 
follow this guidance, right? Um, so that's one thing that I look at as to where are we going from here and what do we do, right? The other thing that um, I look at is there are other structural or uh, statutory leaves that are in place. I believe I sent the document across that shows the different leaves that are available based on the needs of staff members who may live in a household with persons who have the underlying medical conditions, things that are available until the end of the year. So it ends like December 31st of 2020, which are, I believe, the FCR, F FFCRA and all those other documents that I sent across. So we have that, we have FMLA, we have so many different leaves. And then we have the leaves um, that have been negotiated through the collective bargaining agreement that we would look to follow those guidelines first. And then um, we would just make decisions from there. But as you mentioned, how, how would we prioritize? That is something that we would have to have a conversation with the, um, the union. And as a district, we would, we would really need to open that conversation because one, we, we don't want to look and say that one person's situation is more dire than another person who's coming in making the same statement. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Demling, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just brief follow-up. So you mentioned leaves. Are, are there... So I'm, I'm trying to think, uh, this is maybe, a, a, I do too detailed of a question, but are there, like, for, if, if someone was, was in a situation where they were like, um, I, I just, they, they couldn't, um, uh, they, didn't, they didn't feel comfortable coming back to work, um, but they've been with the district a long time. Is, are there, is, is there, are there deadlines for, for, for taking leaves of absences? And, and like, how is that, I'm, I'm imagining that's like a, a contracted thing. I'm sorry if that's not a well-formed question <laughs> for like for, for a little for the leave of absence um, situation. So there were some leave. There was an opportunity for staff members by April 1st to let us know if they were going to request a leave for the upcoming year, so that we would be able to work on staffing and make sure make sure that we have enough staff members to cover the students and the courses that are needed for the upcoming year. So that's one. Um, one thing that we did offer, there's also the regular FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, that offers an opportunity for 12 weeks. Okay, um, that offers, the, I'm sorry, I was just reading the chat, that offers the opportunity for staff members to request a leave for um, that can be up to 12 weeks, and that there's a form that comes from the Department of Labor that physicians fill out. And um, they sit, the staff member would sit with the human resource department, bring in the information from their physician, and we would work with them through that. There are the other leaves. Like I said, there's a document. I'm sure that Dr. Morris may have it on his email that he can possibly forward to all of you because that document shows if this is the request. Um, let's say like you're asking if someone has a family member in their household who, need, who they're requesting um, to take a leave because that family member has an underlying health concern, then this is the leave that, may, that they may be eligible for. So there are quite a few. And so for me to try to do it justice and go through that form right now is not going to make sense. So, like I said, it's, it's a document that I put together um, today with the collective bargaining agreement leaves. And then there was a document that was sent to us from the DESI attorney that has all of the other leaves in there. And so those combined, along with the if-then spreadsheet, would be best able to answer all those questions and help you guys as you make your decisions. Uh, Dr. Morris? Uh, the other thing I want to add to what Mr. Cunningham had said is that um, just highlighting that, you know, there will be negotiations with our bargaining units, and I please note the plural uh, when I say units, um, uh, before next year, because like many other places, you know, bargaining or, you know, unions will want to meet about work conditions, rightfully so. Um, 
So I do think uh, some of this discussion, uh, if there are opinions about it, uh, might be well situated for executive session uh, to prepare for those negotiations. Next week on the agenda for the for these groups, we'll, well, it's really just the region, but um, we'll be to identify who will be ne negotiating with the bargaining units. And again, as I said, there's multiple ones, as Ms. Cunningham has primary person in those meetings knows very well it's it's not just one set of meetings it's it's multiple groups um because the needs of you know custodians versus food service workers versus um teachers paras and clerical they're, they're different groups uh, with different needs and and so i do wonder if um just as the further we go out on this uh limb whether some of this might be it, i think what most cunningham has shared is informational which is great but i just want to um, pause here just to say that there will be an opportunity for you all, uh, if you choose, to be able to talk about negotiation strategy and a lot of these details um, and express opinions about those things before the representatives begin to negotiate with the bargaining units. Ms. Dancer and then Ms. Hall. Um, so I'm sitting here looking at three different statements. I'm looking at the one from the attorney, I'm looking at the one from the original staff document, and I'm looking at the suggested one from Ms. Spitzer. And it's very confusing to me to be looking at three different things. Are we without seeing it as it's, as it's going to be? So if we were going to vote on this tonight, I would not be prepared until I can actually see written out what it is we're going to be voting on. This, what you see on your screen is what we will be voting on tonight. And what about the recommendation from the attorney, which is different than this? That's not what, unless somebody makes a motion to, um, to provide a different, a different statement. Um, that's the, what's, what the attorney sent to us is attorney privilege. Um, uh -huh. so, if we if we want to incorporate any sort of insight or ideas that that were proposed there we would prepare them into a new statement um here so there would be an opportunity to do that at a at a later date even if we vote on this tonight i, I don't i well it's up to the committee what what we talk about at at future at future meetings uh -huh. i think um, what we're what we're discussing tonight is if we want to amend our current document that uh -huh. um, that uh, was approved last week, um, and if so, with what language? Um, so I, I think those are the decisions in front of us. And as Dr. Morris helpfully explained, there are pieces of this that actually would need to be addressed in executive session and in potential and, and definite, sorry, uh, future negotiations with um, our unions. Um, so not necessarily to be included in any statement that we uh, explore tonight. Hmm. And Ms. Hall, did you have a... <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I share Mr. Demling's concerns um, about staffing the model that we've voted on. Um, hearing the very practical concerns from a human resources perspective that this that the proposed language would be extremely challenging, if not impossible to implement, um, really gives me pause. Um, but then, you know, hearing that there is this existing avenue to have really detailed discussions via negotiations with the bargaining units means that it's not like this conversation is over. It's just that this part of the conversation in this setting with these individuals could be over. And then the more detailed part where we wouldn't have to do all of this verbal gymnastics and could actually like have that confidential discussion via negotiations could, I think, happen in a more efficient way. Um, and I mean, I'm sure I sound like a broken record. I just, time is of the essence here. And I feel, I'm, I'm worried that if we, if we keep talking or if we talk about then continuing to talk beyond this about it, like we're, we're getting into a, a timeline that just doesn't give the district enough time to, to implement and to plan. 
Um, Ms. Spitzer, and then uh, also uh, Dr. Morris, would you be able to stop presenting for a little bit so that we can all see each other? That would be helpful. And if we come back to it, we can look at it again. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer. So I would just, um, I agree. I don't think voting on this language tonight makes sense. Um, I still strongly feel the way I do. Um, and I would like to just state my frustration somewhat with the process because I do feel like I um, requested an opportunity to discuss this in executive session and maybe I'm still learning how to, um, like, I, I, I just want to make sure that we, we do have this conversation um, in executive session and that we continue to, um, you know, I have no doubt that Doreen and, and the rest of the human resources staff at our school will do everything they can to prioritize um, individuals who have real medical concerns. And, and none of this is kind of stemmed from um, a feeling that, um, and any, any, anything else. Like I, I, I believe that, that the district does, is, is trying its best to, to deal with a really, really difficult situation as we all are. So I wanted to, to, to leave with that, but I, I also feel like, um, you know, we were asked, I just want to say, like, we were asked to provide guidance and we haven't actually voted on the models yet. I would like to point that out, like, this is still, we're still talking about guidance. And so I would just, again, state very strongly and with full force that whoever's going to go to bat to negotiate, and I think we, we need to defend our ability to teach all of our students, but I, we can't do that without our teachers. And we need to make sure they feel comfortable walking through the doors when they come in to teach our kids. So I'm, I'm happy to take this off the table, but that's, that, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Mr. Menino. I think we discussed this issue last time. Uh, this is a guarantee, as I read it, to teachers who don't want to come back uh, so they don't have to come back. I think it's important that we vote on the issue tonight. I understand Ms. Spitzer's problem, uh, but the students students need take a priority, and I don't believe we can provide this guarantee to staff and teachers. That's my position. Um, Ms. Lord, and then Mr. Demling. I thought last week we discussed how it was a guidance, not a guarantee, so I, I'm a little confused on the language between that. Um, the scenario that I keep hearing is that if enough teachers don't want to do it, we can't support the model. I also want to say if enough teachers leave the district because they don't feel heard or safe, then we also won't be able to provide um, teachers for the model. And um, I've heard about we've gone above and beyond the law or whatever that language is. I just want to say these are above and beyond times for all of us, above and beyond our comfort zone, our exhaustion level. and. Um, I think we're just going to have to be used to going above and beyond for a while while we try to navigate all these different moving parts um, together. And then I just want to also say there's going to, I think there's flexibility with our families. Um, I know some have reached out saying, oh, thank you for mentioning that, oh, if you have this two extra teachers that want remote, but more people said in person, I'd be flexible or my family might have that flexibility to say, okay, let's switch to remote for a while until things get figured out. So thank you, but I also agree that maybe we need to do this in executive session. Thank you. Um, Dr. Morris, Mr. Demling, are you okay listening to Dr. Morris? Or Mr. Demling, for, Mr. Demling first and then Dr. Morris. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I can defer to Dr. Morris and then go after. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Um, so I just wanted to say, you know, respectfully in terms of kind of the piece to vote tonight or not. I don't think for us, you know, and from the staff side, I think if the committee was willing to move forward, we know this is a point of bargaining uh, with our units. Not So I don't feel urgency that this, this issue is decided tonight from my end. I'm not suggesting what you should or shouldn't do, but if it's, if it's intended to give guidance or priorities to myself and the administrative team, I think we've heard enough dialogue over the last couple of weeks to know that this is, a, and I don't mean that in a, a flip way uh, at all. I mean, that this is an unsettled issue for the committee, that there are people with different opinions on it. Uh, I imagine our bargaining units will have opinions on it. And that's probably the likely um, arena where this will be decided. 
Um, so for us, you know, or I'll just say for me, but um, I think I can speak even broader than that uh, on this one. Uh, we don't feel urgency or I don't feel urgency that there's a, a yay or nay vote tonight because I think the document as it is gives up enough guidance to take next steps. Um, and we know that this is going to be something that the committee members who were volunteer themselves for bargaining uh, are going to be able, going to have to get guidance on in an executive session uh, from the committee. Uh, and then they're going to have to bargain and come back to the committee and say, here's where we are, here's, here's what the requests are um, that we're receiving from the units. Uh, and I think that's probably the decision-making tree for it. So I think deciding tonight for me, uh, frankly, um, I don't, again, I'm, I'm not intending to sound flip at all, uh, but I actually think it's something that's going to come back anyway, whether the committee th thinks it's decided it tonight or not, because it is going to be in, in, in every community, uh, one of these things that, that plays out at the negotiating table. And I think having those discussions in executive session uh, makes sense to me. And then that's a, a two-way or iterative process where the committee members who are on the bargaining team come back to the committee and say, here's where we are. Do we Are we in the same place? Are we in a different place? And that, that's likely how it's going to play out, no matter if you take a vote or not tonight. So, you know, I think if it's something that there's still um, some different opinions on, I don't feel like anyone needs to be pushed into voting for us. Whether you all need to do it for you, <laughs> that's not a thing I'm, I'm going to comment on. But for us, it's not something that is uh, holding us up or making us sort of linger because I think it will come up in negotiations. Mr. Demley? Yeah, so just a couple of process um, observations, comments for our committee to think about. Um, one is um, whatever we, however we do or don't uh, amend this in future meetings, um, I feel very strongly personally that it's either all three of our committees together or I don't think we should change this at all. Even if it's something I personally feel like should be changed, okay? If I propose a change, and I go to the mat saying it should happen. If, if I don't see strong um, support from all three of our committees, I will vote against my own proposal. <laughs> all right, and that's because because of the intertwined nature of our three joint committees, as has been well established. Um, you know, this this train falls off the rails if 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 all three of us aren't going forward together. So I feel pretty strongly about that. That's just one. Um, second point is, you know, this question of when is something decided. It's, it's always a funny thing in school committee land, right? Um, typically something's decided when it's voted, but something can always be reconsidered and revoted. So not something, you know, things are never really decided in school committee land because they can always come back. So, um, you know, the way I look at this is that um, for the framework for planning document, as, as we called it, um, all three committees unanimously voted that. And it was, it was fairly specific. I mean, you can call it a model or not, you know, but it, it talked about four to five days a week at K to six and at least two days a week on site, uh, seven to 12. It was fairly specific. It, it didn't cover every single implementation detail. And we have some major decisions um, where we're, I think we're voting uh, phasing uh, model next week. Uh, we still have um, whether or not four to six will be hybrid and whether Crocker Farm five or six um, will be at Crocker Farm or at ARMS. Okay, so there are definitely important implementation details to be had, but, but that was a fairly meaty um, framework document. Now, is it technically possible that 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 uh, a majority of our three committees could want to revisit that? Yes, like that. Robert's Rules of Order. We could get that on the agenda again, and we could we could change it every week if we want. I think that's probably impractical for implementation purposes. Um, but you know, I would also point out that it's not like look, we passed it, if you changed your mind, too bad. You know, one of the overall goals in there is remain flexible and adjust plans as needed according to changing conditions. And we'll hold the district and the superintendent to that. You know, the superintendent is not gonna come back and say, well, I have this document, you know, you, you told me to do this. And you know, that, that won't be good enough for us. You know, we're gonna expect him to be able to respond to changing COVID conditions and be very flexible. So I, I don't have a lot of Concern that um, you know some some wording in that that Google Doc that we voted is going to constrain us and not be able to let us respond to those 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 conditions. So um, you know I, I I feel like the discussion, even though it's been very difficult to have, um, and and it has led to some consternation, 
is I think it's been good. I think it's been good to push these two. I think I've uh, coined it as irreconcilable, um, but I, th I think it's these two very uh, high priority things uh, ahead at the same time about educating our students and maximizing staff and student safety um, and seeing where those tension points lie and, and having people um, work out those details. I think it's a bit important for us to have the conversation. I really do appreciate uh, what Ms. Lord and Ms. Spitzer have brought forward. Um, I don't think it's been a waste of time. Um, as anxious as I am for the process to move along, I don't think it has been a waste of time. And I, I appreciate um, the discussions that we've had. Thank you. Um, any other uh, comments uh, from anybody who hasn't spoken that would like to speak? I'm uh, after listening to all this conversation and everything. Um, I, I'm in favor of leaving the document as it is, and considering changing it at some point in the future if um, Dr. Morris comes back uh, talking about it. If other committee members, is something. I, I'm just in favor of leaving it where it is right now. That's probably all that needs to be said. Is there any further discussion on this? Ms. Stancer? Um, I guess I would say that I would be in favor of leaving it as, as, it, as it is, but only because of all the other information that has come out of this discussion. Understanding that there's going to be negotiating and that there will be an opportunity in executive sessions for the committee to understand what's going on with with the staff so so yes i mean this was really beneficial to have the conversation that we've had tonight thank you i i completely agree with uh, everybody's comments um great so if there's no further discussion from others uh are we ready to move on to the next agenda item? I'm seeing some nodding heads. Okay. Our next agenda item is um, warrant report. And um, for the Amherst committee, I actually, I did. Oh, thank you, Mr. Harrington. Sorry, I did not <laughs> let you know that we are ready to have you back. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, the so I, I did prepare. I have uh, the reports ready. Um, and I don't know, Ms. Spitzer, if you have any for the region, but you can. Uh... OK, I thought that I had them up, but. OK. So. Uh, I, Allison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $18,907.50 for the warrant dated July 20th, 2020. This includes general fund expenses of $6,320.31, revolving fund expenses of $4,880, and grant fund expenses of $7,707.19. And I signed that on July 27th. I have two more. Um, I, Allison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $116,793.97 for the warrant dated June 30th, 2020, for general fund expenses of $116,316.57, revolving fund expenses of $164.40, and grant fund expenses of $313. And I signed that on July 27th. And the last one is um, I authorized for payroll 
on uh, July 20th, wages subject to Medicare of $602,496.68. So that is my warrant report. Ms. Spitzer, do you have any to report? I have five. <laughs> so, so apologies for making this meeting longer, um, but I'll, I'll try to make it quick. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $571,582.64 um, for the warrant dated July 8th, 2020. And this was um, all for payroll. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $620,587.09 for the warrant dated July 22nd, 2020. And again, this was all for payroll. And I signed that on July 24th, 2020. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $2,132.60 for a warrant dated July 22nd, 2020. And um, this was authorizing payroll on, for July 22nd. And again, I signed this on um, July 24th, 2020. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $1,003,593.11 for the warrant dated June 24th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $956,249.16, revolving fund expenses of $8,293.60, and grant fund expenses of $32,235.74, and other funds in the amount of $6,814.61 for gifts. And this was signed on July 24th, 2020. Last one, um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $118,178.72 for the warrant dated July 22nd, 2020. And this included um, just general fund expenses. And that was dated um, or signed by me on July 27th, 2020. Thank you. Thank you. And I saw that um... Pelham will review their warrants at their Pelham only committee meeting. So, um, thank you. Um, so, uh, next up is gifts, and I don't believe we have any gifts, uh, seeing a head shake. So, um, uh, would somebody from Amherst like to make a motion? Oh, or Pelham. <laughs> don't we have to talk about future agenda items, or is it not appropriate? Oh, we didn't put that on the agenda this week, but we um, will be meeting, um, I believe, on Tuesday of next week. Okay. Um, and uh, can we speak? Okay. What those agenda items are, if it's not on our agenda. Yep. I think if you're stating them, that's okay, but I think it wouldn't be something that could be discussed. Okay. So um, we will be looking at the feedback from the surveys that's going out on the phasing models and potentially voting on those. Um, the other, there's um, uh, FAQs um, that we would like to publish on the fall 2020 planning website that we will also look at. Um, and I think also the voting on the uh, appointing our representative for the union negotiations was also what I had written down. Um, if there are any other questions or requests for agenda items, please email me and Ms. Hall um, this uh, before Thursday of this week. Ms. Seeger. I'm just looking at uh, dates from our last meeting, the very last agenda item, and it has July 30th, 2020, a school committee meeting phasing vote. And I don't know which school committee that is, and it, it sounds like that's not even a thing. So the, the next meeting is is next Tuesday. Yes. So we that because of the 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 added meetings that we had since last Tuesday, um, so namely Thursday's Amherst meeting and tonight's meeting. That's yeah. why that one got pushed to um, the fourth. Um, okay. And we will look at the sort of 
the rest of the plan for um, for meetings um, at next week's meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so would somebody from Amherst like to make a motion? I move to adjourn. Second. Moved by Spitzer, second by Demling. Roll call vote, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Am Amherst is adjourned and we'll see each other again in a little bit. Uh, Ms. Hall. All right, would anyone from Pelham like to make a motion? I move that we adjourn. Right, move by Nino and seconded by Kenny. Roll call vote, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. Okay. Somebody from the region would like to make a motion? I move to adjourn the region. Lord second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Lord. No discussion. And so we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.